We are kicking off tonight Maker Weeks, Glow's Maker Week. It's pretty exciting, actually. There are a bunch of people in the community that are engaged in making in a variety of ways. Uh, a number, countless disciplines, um, ages of all spectrum. And uh, tonight what we're doing is, every, every night, in fact, we're having a series of talks, if you've seen the schedule. And we're kicking off tonight with a few people who are representative of different areas. Uh, this is going to be very informal, so the, the goal here is to have a dialogue and discussion that's very open-ended. Um, but my name's Dave, uh, Dave Salento, and my, my company is Digifab Lab. We do sort of educational consulting and design services for people using digital tools. And the people on stage here are engaged in different ways. I don't know if you, do you have a, uh, the handout, do they have this handout of who is what? at the front up here. Okay, so I'll start right here. Uh, Troy Alessi is on the end right here. He's a, uh, an educational uh, STEM teacher with the State College School District. has been doing this for only 23 years. And uh, as he tells me, he's been making things since he was seven. So he's at least 30, if you're doing the math, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> <laughs> um, next to him, we have Victor DiDonato. And he is with the UPS stores. We're really fortunate to have here, one of 52 locations nationwide that are actually doing 3D printing, and uh, it's exceptionally cool. I got to go over and check it out. I, how many of you have seen the 3D printer that they have there? Okay, so go bug him and, uh, and check it out. It's super cool. They have a very nice machine, and one of the events, we're going to be 3D printing scanning heads. Yep. Is that Thursday? Yep. Thurs yes. yes. Okay, so on Thursday, come by bring your extended family, you know, 20 or 30 of your closest friends, get scanned, and uh, at the UPS store, they've offered a really awesome discount for $15, you can have a little head printed. Do we have one here? I don't think Upstairs, we do. Oh, we don't have one. Well, somebody will have to run up and get one. But uh, it'll probably be about, something yeah, like that. It's about like, an inch in diameter. Yeah, like so. yay tall. But uh, this will be your chance to be like, you know, the wealthy barons of the past and have your own little head printed. And if you want to have it scaled up, don't, don't feel limited by the, the budget for $15 at the cut rate. You can probably do it as high as what, eight inches? Uh, uh, we, yeah, we could do a life size. <laughs> well, we, we could go life size. We could make you triple the size. Um, but anyway, uh, what, Victor, you've been there for how long? Been there over years? a decade. 10 years, yeah. Yep. And yeah. Uh, worked for UPS for a number of years as well at the same time, so. Yeah, so it's fantastic that they're, they're chipping in with uh, the efforts here. Um, Amy Frank is the owner of a brand new endeavor called The Makery, which is opening its door September, what? September 2nd. September. Mm -hmm. We've been open all summer for yeah. camps and yeah. parties and things, but yeah. This is a brand new enterprise. Eventually. Brand new enterprise with uh, educational programming mm -hmm. and making of all different kinds, all mm -hmm. different media. Um, Amy also has a... Uh, yoga equipment company, right? And that mm -hmm. is called Mindfully Made Studios. Mm -hmm. So for you yogis in the crowd, um, you can you can bend yourself into a pretzel and then model it. <laughs> um, and Nathaniel Rasmussen is the head of IT services here at SCLO. And I have to give a, a sort of special um, uh, commendation to Nathaniel because you know we have been talking about making here in the community trying to expand this uh, with the discovery space, with New Leaf. And uh, initially, uh, myself and a few others got together and said, you know, how can we grow this? And SCLO was our first meeting to, to say, is this a crazy idea, like, to involve the library? And Nathaniel was like, no, this is not crazy. We want to be doing this because the future of libraries, and Nathaniel will be talking about this, we, we embrace information and knowledge, so you know, what better way to share things than with these digital tools. So I say, uh, let's get started. Each person will talk, mm, I don't know, five minutes or so, a little bit about their area of, of experience and um, what they're doing. And then we're just really gonna have like a round table discussion where you ask questions, like what is this making stuff? And uh, our esteemed panel will try and answer it. So let's start, which, which end do we wanna start on? Do you have a preference? I'll start. Okay, yeah, Nathaniel, since you're with SCLO, let's start yeah. with you. Sure. I also wanted to say that, um, that now is also a good chance if you had a question about the program or the week, we can also talk about that. It doesn't have to be the lofty, fun stuff that, that we can wax poetic on. There are some 
fun stuff planned throughout the week, so feel free to ask questions about that when we get to the Q&A. Um, but yeah, uh, the library is really excited to be here. Um, this has been a really interesting and fun experience working with so many partners in our community around this very abstract idea, making. I mean, you know, I think that's a pretty human thing to make something, but um, it's kind of also hard to explain. And so hopefully I think, you know, with four different perspectives, we might have a chance to nail it down a little bit. But I think you probably all have your own idea of what that means too. So I think it'll be, it'll be a good conversation. And I think, you know, it's kind of, from the library's perspective, what our goal was in working with all these great partners is um, starting a conversation in our community. You know, what, what kind of things do we want to see in this kind of concept? So um, all of you are very welcome to talk to any of us as much as you want to about this stuff. So you have a great idea. I also want to point out, we have some posters around the library. We are going to be um, asking for everyone's opinion about Maker Week. So you can fill it out every day if you want to. If you want to fill it out at the end of the week, then give us your, your whole opinion. It's just a short survey. Uh, it's also where you can sign up if you want to get involved uh, to, in future events. So I wanted to point that out. Um, Victor in the UPS store has generously offered a custom 3D printed smartphone case to a lucky uh, survey respondent as well. So a little extra motivation if, if you need to have that uh, case that no one else has. Um, but yeah, uh, the library, you know, a lot, a lot of people are like, what, you know, libraries are, are books and, and that's really important, but, but why, why are libraries interested in 3D printers or, you know, other technology crafting? Um, I think, you know, most libraries, you probably have some inkling as we had today you know, it's a place some people come to do knitting and things like that. So I think that's that's a little bit of continuity for us. But we're we're excited because um, we see our role is changing as everything else around us is changing. And it's not that we're planning on you know taking the books out to the curb anytime soon. We love books. We support them. We we get really excited about reading, and we want people to read and and, and do all the things that you traditionally know about at a library. But at the same time. You know, we used to serve a specific purpose in our community, and I think we still do, but it's just kind of changed. Uh, our, our purpose a long time ago was, was for a lot of people how, you know, if I was a farmer and I needed to know what kind of chemical to spray to take care of a particular issue, or if I needed a, um, a legal question answered, you know, any of those kinds of things, it was information that they came to the library to get an answer for. Now, Granted, I imagine most of you probably don't first think when you have a question, oh, I'm going to call the library and have, have that answer. Um, you know, information is available to everyone. It's in their pocket. It's on their lap. Um, and we still serve that purpose to some extent. And, and um, you know, we can help you with those deeper, harder research questions um, more than probably most people realize. But I think one of the things that has changed in our, in our culture is is that people um, we're all we're all creators of information now at a level that we've never seen before um, you know whether it's doing a home video blog about your favorite TV shows or uh, you just have a Twitter feed you know that's that's a feed of information you have your own channel of information and I think that you know what what stood us out in the in the old ages of information was that we were that community, that community hub for that information flow. So you could come in and work on a project together, you could do lots of things. Um, but I think, uh, you know, moving forward in this new era where everyone is a creator, what we're hoping to do is, is um, leverage the fact that a lot of people like us and like to, to come here and, and share and things and um, provide that space and in some cases and in some times some of the tools that you may not have access to so that you can can continue to create and perhaps collaborate um, you know i was reading this afternoon some some definitions of maker spaces and one of the things that stuck out to me was you know that that it's it's about self-guided learning for one which is something we've always been great at at libraries you know you want to learn 
you don't have to have this sort of rigorous curriculum. You can just sort of come to the library and follow your nose and, and grow and learn. So I think we do that really well. Um, you can collaborate in a makerspace, so you can come together with someone that has a totally different skill set or a different set of interests and find some common ground that potentially might create a great product or uh, a great piece of art or just something really neat that you want to share with your friends. Um, and uh, you know, our sort of neutral platform at the library, I think, is very conducive for that. People feel welcome here and they can come. So I think to us, Maker Week is a, a situation where we want to hear from you. Is this something you want? Is this something you want the library to, to invest more in? Um, is this something that our community needs? I think it is. I think, um, you know, unfortunately all these information streams have also sort of fractured us in some ways. You know, we spend a lot more time like this and a lot less time like this. And, and so I'm hoping that, that um, you know, we, we can engage in that way with, with the maker, maker movement, however it may be defined, which I'll leave up to some of these other folks. That sounds great. Yeah. Um, let's, uh, what we'll do is we'll just go around a little bit and then we can do a little bit of question and answer. So Amy, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit more about what you're involved in and what you're hoping to do. Sure. I love this versus this. That's, that's yeah. really what our makery is about as well. Um, my name is Amy Frank and I recently opened a place at 209 West Calder Way, um, a beautiful inspired art studio called The Makery. Um, we specialize there in creative classes, um, parties, events, workshops, and um, just open studio time for children and adults um, in a variety of creative disciplines. We're a collective of um, seven local artists, and we teach um, sewing and fabric craft, um, adult painting and drawing, children's painting and drawing, jewelry design, knitting, photography, and um, a few other uh, smaller classes here or there. Um, we are not, we're new to that space, but we're not really new to the community. We were in Bullsburg, Pennsylvania for about four years as the studio at Contempo. We were right on the diamond and that space um, closed uh, this summer for a variety of reasons. And we've always wanted to bring the concept downtown just to, um, to kind of grow it and see how far we can we can take it here in downtown state college and we're just so excited to be part of um the to be part of this community and to maybe do a little more outreach with college students and um, just a broader population than we could reach in bullsburg uh, and the reason that we we created the studio at contempo and now the makery was because we believe there's a real need for children and adults to um, physically uh, create things that are um, artistic expressions in their own right, uh, not create things on an iPad, which is what I think a lot of our kids know how to do really well, um, but how to create things with paper and pens and um, markers and fabric. And a lot of the things we teach are lost arts. Um, and it's amazing when children come into our space and realize that they have all of these beautiful materials and this beautiful space at their fingertips and they can just make things and that's really what inspires us um, day to day and, and what I really think uh, we're excited to bring uh, to the community. Um, we're particularly excited about our open studio time. We found as we we're kind of polling people over the last year and really planning for this new space that so many of us adults just want a place to come together and be creative in a beautiful space and that's what we'll be offering a lot at the Makery in addition to our classes. and. Um, events and, and workshops. So. Amy, I just have a quick question for you. Given your interest in fostering some of the traditional skills for mm -hmm. making, um, what, where do you sit on the interest of you know, any kind of digital, or do you see any digital integration at all? Do you see a blend, or, or do you see this being a separate kind of endeavor? Well, tell us more about your position on that. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Um, I, I continue to say we need to walk before we run because there's so much, um, as Nathaniel was saying, there's so much interest in making the maker community and there's so much interest in, we're seeing a lot of interest just specifically in the creative arts that we teach, um, that we want to do what we already know we do well 
and what we already have an interest in and then kind of blend um, those in slowly. We've had a lot of interest in um, folks that want to teach video production. At, uh, that's a real interest for kids and we really want to attract more of a um, young male audience, uh, you know, um, boys and men, because we really seem to attract a lot of girls and women um, and that is, a, that is a real interest of those of those folks, so we um, we're talking some talks here and there, and I could, I would love to um, see where that goes in the next year. But we're walking before we run. Yeah, that's good. I wanted to see if you could be our devil's advocate. That's why I'm asking. Right, so, right. And I just want to verify in case people didn't catch the address. It's 209 West Calder Way. 209 West Calder Way. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Great. Yeah. All right, Victor. All right, I'm uh, Victor Didonato with the UPS store. Uh, we're the location uh, across from Wegmans off of North Atherton. And uh, we have actually two locations, one here and one in Altoona. Our state college, one has the uh, 3D printing. Most people, when I go to expos and talk to people on the street, and say, why is the UPS store, why is UPS doing 3D printing? Uh, well, I guess you have to go back, and Nathaniel touched on kind of evolving. Um, you know, way back when we were mailboxes, et cetera, we did mailboxes and copies. Um, then UPS bought the UPS store, and we turned into a shipping center. Um, probably about half a decade ago, um, you know, we wanted to kind of diversify our portfolio. Um, so we started really getting heavy into print, everything from business cards to flyers, brochures, kind of you name it, wide format. We do all that stuff. And, um, you know, with, with the CIMP lab um, on campus and kind can, of brain power. Can you define that for everybody who might not know what the CIMP it's the lab is? the Center for Innovative and Processes. Material Processing. Material metal, metal Processing, processing. yeah. So it's basically it's taking powder and making a 3D you know, microphones, what have you, out of it. Um, you know, with that in the area, with the brain power, with the incubator, with the chamber, we have so much in this in this area that we don't kind of think about. And um, you know, the chamber and, and Tim Simpson, Penn State are trying to pull it full circle. Um, kind of our niche, you know, is trying to be able to take people's ideas and kind of take that from concept to reality. Um, we've always been a kind of a one-stop shop for small, medium-sized businesses. Like I mentioned, with the mailboxes, with the printing. Well, now if they have an idea for a prototype, we can print it. We can come consult with them. Um, if they need, need a part that has movable objects, we can do that. Um, we actually had a model locomotive scanned and 3D printed. Um, so really nothing is out of our reach. Having a nationwide reach with uh, 52 stores that have it. And then um, the make of our 3D printer is actually Stratasys. We have relationships with them for, for other uh, methods like stereolithography and, and, uh, and other methods as well. Um, so kind of our niche is really helping at-home inventors, engineers, architects um, take, their, take their idea and get it into form. Um, in fact, anymore, a lot of lawyers, attorneys are recommending that people get um, something 3D printed as far as the concept. As you have proof of concept, you can't debate. You know, you have a receipt from the UPS store saying it has something printed. Um, you have a physical object that's not just an abstract idea. Um, so it allows for that as well. So. That's great. Um, it's a pretty amazing resource because in the community, there are very few outlets that actually allow you to print something locally. And when you do 3D print something, it's a lot about iteration. Anybody who's tried to develop an idea or a product, there's always a a lot of refinement going on. But I, I do want to underscore uh, a name that was mentioned here by Victor. Tim Simpson has been an incredible force in the area for trying to foster making um, the CIMP Center. It, it is a pretty remarkable place. They do metal 3D printing research, which is the hottest new area. I mean, we have up Literally. here, we're going to have some plastic printers, which are consumer grade printers. But um, metal printing is where things are going, and it's pretty remarkable. I mean, we're talking about printing airplane parts and uh, nuclear submarine propellers and things that are very difficult to make. So um, uh, commendations to, to your efforts to actually bring this here locally, because there are very few resources to do it. So I'm really excited. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. OK, Troy, let's hear a little bit more. And I think you've got. Uh, You've got some home entertainment uh, video for us here, right? Are you going to show that? Yeah, I am. Uh, I'm Troy Lisi. I teach over at State College High School in the area of advanced computer graphics, uh, engineering graphics. And I couldn't get by without bringing a few photos along because when I thought about making, I've been on the committee all summer helping, helping these people put together, um, working with them, 
the whole plan for the week and seeing that develop and evolve with, with everybody's input, and it's been wonderful. So I, I'm representing the educational part of, of making, um, coming from the high school perspective and, and what that involves. I wanted to go back because when I thought about what it means to be a maker, um, the first thing that came to my mind was for me, this is my slideshow, uh, being a maker started like when I was seven years old, eight years old. Now I had a grandfather, and, and pardon me if this is politically correct, but uh, he was a gunsmith. And I got to watch him make these beautiful gun stocks out of all different types of woods that in his basement using some pretty crude tools. But when he was done, they were, they were beautiful. Uh, and, and I was inspired by that. So at seven or eight, I started getting involved with basic woodworking. The next slide uh, may not look like anything to you, but when, when I look at it, I see the beginning of what it was for me to be a maker. And that, by the way, is a barn stick uh, matchstick holder uh, that hangs on my mother's wall. So it now you know, has some flowers in it, dried flowers, but uh, that was the idea. You know, it doesn't look like very much, but that's got, that got me started. And again, I, I made that, I think, in 1985, somewhere in that ballpark. We'll get back into the woodworking side of things a little bit later and where, where the whole making idea for me came from and where, how it's led me to education. Um, so there are a lot of other steps in between there and this. College classes in materials and material science. Um, so this is a hot metals, cold metals class where I got to make uh, a cast bell uh, forged stand for it. Uh, and in the next slide you're going to see uh, cold rolled uh, brass lantern. Woodworking was always a passion for me through this. And I started to see a lot of different areas grow. And you have to remember back, so many people in the audience are not going to be young enough to be able to say, well, before computers. Computers were there, but they weren't in your face, like Nathaniel was talking about with you people holding your cell phones, um, having tablets right there in front of you, and having the information readily available. Uh, you had to go to a dedicated lab and, and get into it. And that was just starting to become pretty relevant to education, the computer labs and the design spaces. Um, so pretty much everything up until this point for me was all kind of hand skills. And I always had kind of, the way Amy is maybe in the art field, more of a technical nature, but still making stuff. Artistic, but just more in a technical way. Uh, th this picture takes me back to everything in the picture I made. Now, how does this lead me into the, into the making and the making community and what's going on this week at the, uh, the Make Week 2015? Well, these skills took me to education. And along the way, I started to mention computer skills, computer training, computer labs. I got very heavy into virtual design, CAD design, animation, modeling, and I've uh, been involved with that. So it, leading me up to my job at uh, State College Area High School, which I've been doing for 23 years, uh, I've been teaching woodworking early on in my career, uh, computer-aided drafting, architectural drafting, and computer engineering graphics, which I've been doing primarily for the past 15 years. For a lot of that time, it was all virtual models. There was no way to be able to take a virtual model and be able to get it out somewhere in your hands. Uh, now, about 10, 11 years ago, we got our first 3D printer, a Stratasys printer, in the school. Uh, the, the vocational program which I wasn't part of, bought on a grant. And we were able to use that on a limited basis to be able to give prints to students. The problem is, is that printer cost about $500 to be able to fill with plastic and be able to give models to students was not very cost productive. Uh, so we ended up using that on a very limited basis. What you can see here in the picture is a model that one of my students had created. It was a virtual model that looked great. And when you show it to somebody, in all honesty, with the information today being right in front of you, someone says, that's a great picture. Did you download that? No, that was a real 3D model um, that the student actually made in a couple of weeks, which was pretty amazing to me, but he made it in my classroom. So we took it to the printer and created the first 3D printer um, version of that car, which was, at the time, pretty remarkable that it was 10 years ago. Uh, and, and you can see that. We did the whole, this whole chassis, the undercarriage, everything for that. I have all those parts and pieces, and so does he. Uh, I also have to mention that, that as part of the area that I'm in, we do video game design, programming, 
developing still the virtual models, but now for a different purpose, being able to program and code those to be able to work in video games. So just a couple little screenshots, and if you follow my, my link off from Nathaniel's uh, page here at SQLO, uh, takes you to my page and you can see some student work and student examples. I've been involved with some really fantastic projects in education for the grades 9 through 12 that I'm involved with. Um, going back about four years ago, the, the uh, Penn State Lunar Lion program approached us and asked us if we had students that could be involved with helping to develop physical models and some virtual models that they could showcase to Lunar Lion. Now, how many people know about the Lunar Lion program? Okay, so Penn State is planning on launching a moon lander at some point down the road. They were planning on later this year, and that's not going to happen. They're still going to do that either uh, next year or the year after. Uh, they, they were trying to get more interdisciplinary uh, action on that, plan involvement in that uh, before they launch. In any case, it was our students that work with a team of engineers coming from the Lunar Lion program and the mechanical engineering department on campus to be able to put together the models that you see there uh, that we printed for them. They took those models. The purpose was to be able to take them around the country, showcase the people and say, we're, we're looking for funding to be able to invest in Penn State and be able to say, we want to launch this, which was going to cost somewhere in the ballpark of 55 to $60 million to get a launch going. I see the, the expression there. That's about how much it costs to be able to get a, a launch to happen to get to the moon. So it's a pretty expensive deal. I appreciated that reaction, though. Uh, now, these models cost about $10 million of that. No, I'm, I'm kidding on that. I just, just a little kickback. Uh, so anyhow, these were all student-developed, working hand-in-hand -hand with the engineers, which was a great project. And again, it wouldn't have been possible without the use of 3D printers. Now, taking that a little bit further, um, actually this year, early on this year, we were involved with the Center Community Book Bench Project. Anybody heard, of, heard about that? Uh, to my amazement, they released one of them to the wild um, here in front of the, I'm not sure if I'm pointing the right direction, but in front of the, the uh, community building, right? And then it got taken back. And I went down to see it later that evening and it already was gone. And I'm wondering, you know, when it's going to come back. They're going to release those, I guess, all, all at the same time. But it was our students who developed the, the model for that based on a London book bench design, which has become popular over there. And we were asked if we could create a virtual model that would re represent that uh, concept again. And you can see the actual book bench that was placed down in front of the community center. Uh, pretty good likeness. That was developed by my computer engineering graphics two class. Just some other things that we've done um, in the process. I mean, it's always kind of a fun mix of uh, being able to get technical projects involved with programming, making things, materials, 3D printed chess set. Actually, this is my daughter. She, she was in my class this year and made that. Uh, and we printed out that full chess set. By the way, a, a good little thing that's been happening, going to the, the consumer side of things. The industrial printers that are out, they're fantastic. And what we are is kind of a stepping stone to that, what you're going to see at the Simp Lab and places like that where these metallurgy printing um, techniques are, are becoming more relevant. Um, the polymer-based, plastic-based printers that are out right now. Looking back 10 years ago at the Stratasys printer that we had that cost $500 to be able to fill with plastic, would have, this chest set would have been about mm, $100 to $150. Out of reach for most people. Most people would say, well, it's not worth it. Today's printers, to be able to fill that same size printer, is about $35 for that plastic. So we're looking at a, a more than a 10% cost savings and be able to get the materials into the students' hands and be able to have them take something home that they designed. Um, so along the way, also, we, we get into laser cutting, laser designing. We have a laser machine over in the program. Um, just a couple little projects I put in there, a slide of uh, holiday projects some students have done. To some, some more modern um, technology, we're now getting into some Arduino and some Raspberry Pi programming and involvement with the designs. So if you know about those kind of concepts, we're doing those in class as well. And one of the, two of the camps this week, three of the camps this week are doing those types of training. The, the Buggy Project, help me out, we have Coding for Kids, we have... Uh, coding for Kids tomorrow night, and then on uh, Saturday we're going to have a general Arduino class as well. Yeah, and to add, I think Discovery Space did a, and just to define Arduino and Raspberry Pi, for those of you, this sounds like, you know, are these food groups or what are they? <laughs> um, 
Thank they're, you, David. They're, they're very that. inexpensive microcontrollers that will allow you to do things. And uh, Discovery Space just had a workshop today for kids age eight to Michelle? eleven, eight to 11 um, where they created little cars. Did uh, were was there a success? Uh, they're still building. They're still hour. building. All right. It was a two-hour workshop that's still going on, and uh, <laughs> but it was pretty ambitious, and they're really cool little cars that will, will the the kids will be able to actually drive around uh, when they're done. They're gonna race them on Saturday at eleven thirty. Keep going. That's part of it. Eleven thirty Saturday. Put it on your calendar. Bring your betting slips. <laughs> <laughs> what do I win? Well, you have to win first. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, in any case, going back to that talk, thank you for that clarification. I appreciate that. The uh, Arduino uh, is great because it's so open source, you can do so many things with it. And being able to tie design with computer programming and what students' ideas are. This is a gumball machine that's powered by a secret knock. So you can program for any knock sequence that you want. If you get the knock sequence correct, the Arduino then spins a, a drum that uh, has a gumball sitting in it and then releases that gumball to the successful person's hands. Um, you can see their, their happy faces. <laughs> to some really cool things going on also with 3D printing and some programming, this is Noah Schwab, who's gonna be here later in the week on Saturday. He's gonna be doing a uh, demonstration of drones over at the Parklet. And this is a drone he built with me over in the uh, computer graphics program with all 3D printed parts, except for the motors, electronics, and things like that. Um, did all the soldering himself. Uh, set up a programming of it. So that, that's another great use of technology and, and what wouldn't be possible without the ability of, of makers. Uh, to another little device, this is a Raspberry Pi system, another little micro com uh, computer that Nick Pfeffer had made, one of my students who was going to be here this week, but he had a, a conflict with uh, cross-country track. In any case, he made a Raspberry Pi system that is an old video game emulator. It'll do Atari, do uh, PlayStation, uh, Nintendo, NES 64, uh, Amiga. There's 35 different emulators that it'll run and play all those systems, so it's really cool. Uh, built that from scratch, all 3D design and 3D printed parts. Made the circuit boards himself with me and uh, wired it up and soldered it all, put it together. And it works. So. We're supposed to have an arcade system that's similar to that. Um, available. It may be in the library lobby later in the week or it may be over at the make space, but if you want to see that some more, that's in the pipe as well. <laughs> so uh, let me just jump in here before we do questions and uh, answers, and I don't want to get feedback here. The difference between Troy and I is that he started his career as a maker at age seven. I started mine as a breaker. I just took things apart and then hoped to not have too many leftover pieces. I, I didn't say that I was successfully making. <laughs> <laughs> Ask my mom. I broke a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it starts, right? So tolerate breaking a little bit. It's the, it's the first step. Um, but anyway, why does this matter? Um, we are really, truly in the beginning. We're in the salad days of, of a fascinating era. If I could become seven again at any point in history, it would be right now because the tools that are available, the technology, the skills, and when you unite traditional skills with these evolving, very, very early developmental um, technologies, it's remarkable. And I think everyone in this room is interested in kind of transitioning a culture from consuming to creating. Uh, it's really putting power back in the hands of people to do things that they want to realize their own sort of visions, whether it be entrepreneurial or creative uh, or educational. So it, it's truly a remarkable time. And people are referring to this as the third industrial revolution, mm -hmm. um, with the first obviously being mass production, the second being computation, and the third is, it's kind of like the natural. You've got peanut butter and you have jelly, so you put them together. It's computers involved in making. And uh, I personally, my biggest interest with digital tools is not doing things that um, in substitution of making with the hand, but actually doing things you can't do with the hand. And that's where there's some really interesting opportunities. So um, I absolutely feel that the foundation is to understand the traditional arts. And you know, if you look at you know interests here with, with Amy and Troy having gone from making by hand, that was my path also. I started with woodworking and then did small metals working 
and then glass blowing, and then uh, things like welding and beyond. So that moved into the 3D world. So it really is just, it's an entire ecosystem that involves both the hand and the machine. Mm -hmm. There is no one or the other, in my opinion, any, any longer. So my dream, and we'll open this up for questions and comments, but my dream is tomorrow's kid is Luke Skywalker on Tatooine. You know, that you have that great image of him putting together, it's like filled with robotic junk and, you know, machines and things. And he goes in and just, you know, makes something that can go out and plow the fields or float across the land. I mean, that really isn't so far-fetched anymore. It can happen. It is happening, right? So it's pretty exciting. Anyway, um, questions and comments. Let's hear from you all. We've been blathering. Yes, sir. One of the things Here, that let I, me give you the mic. That I think we're recording this. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Um, yeah, I've been, involved with, with, uh, I've been involved with STEM education for, well, now it's called STEAM. But, uh, I came from the robotics side, and I've been working on it oh, probably for the last 10 years. But I think one of the really interesting aspects of all of this is the notion of teamwork, project-based learning, and collaboration. And what struck me is, is the opportunity, both in education and the library side, or the information sciences side, is the notion of how we can foster collaboration and teamwork. And I thought of your Luke Skywalker fellow, and he's the lone guy. But my experience in industry and everything that I know, especially with globalization, things are done all over the world. Things are done as in teams with different cultures. And I guess the thing of it is, is how as we as makers, be it fabricators or doing whatever engages our, our, our kids, how can we get them to better work in, as, in teams and collaboration? Because I think that's where it's exciting and I, what I've noticed is, is when kids get really amped up, say in the high school or the junior high level. They get amped up when they work in teams and they trust each other and they can do things. So I guess, first of all, I applaud the, your library for doing this. I, I, I think it's a, you're, you're spot on. The question is, what can be done over time to facilitate team building and cooperative interaction? which I think is really the 21st century skill. Because if you can't work you know, with somebody from India or China, or you think you have the answers when you're closing down things, it's how do we foster that? So it's just an observation that, yeah, I, yeah. Um, that I, I think the most important thing is is or, an important thing is, is really collab is the notion of collaboration and team building. Okay, team, how do you want to handle this? Because I know I've got some thoughts on it, but I'm going <laughs> to wait until you go also. first. Yeah. I'm sorry for talking. <laughs> no, 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 it's, a, it's an excellent point. It is a great, great point. And, and I think that an event like this is perfect for what you're talking about. The whole idea is to bring people out to get together with other people and to collaborate on ideas. When I look at some of the student projects that I have done, this is just like you, I'm, tr I'm finding more and more success with group projects than you ever could on individual projects. Uh, and and I th what I find is, is when students see project ideas like I've shown and what people are going to see this week at the Maker Week, they're going to get stimulated to want to do those kinds of things, but they'll find they can't do them without somebody else helping out providing those ideas. So these events, I think, are the perfect culminating parts of that effort to bring people together. Yeah, one thing I, I want to mention, a particular uh, interest, uh, I'm an engineer by training, but how to involve women is in engineering. And what I've always found is if you can team them up, especially when they go in pairs, not in, not in threes, uh, they do marvelous things. And in fact, they'll skunk the guys. Mm -hmm. And 
so the question is, is this is also an opportunity for involving women in technology and women in engineering. And I think it, it's an untapped area, but my experience is, is women engineers are phenomenal. Sure. Anybody else want to chime in here? I think one of the things that the library is interested in talking about in that is, yeah, I think some some of the collaboration stuff is about the, the space. You know, you know, you, you build a space that is friendly and conducive to that, um, and you let people be people, and hopefully that helps. I'm not saying that's enough. I think I think you raise a really good point. As far as um, encouraging young women, I, I absolutely agree. A lot of our professionals on staff here are very interested in that aspect of it as well. Um, looking at, at the library becoming involved in uh, Girls That Code, I think, is that the name of the program? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and some of the others. We've, we've thought about, you know, being official, <coughs> excuse me, venues for that. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think a lot of it's cultural, too, in terms of the collaboration side, is, is you know, what, what happens in that space. I was going to actually single out someone in the audience, and, and John Stutzinger, who's with the, the Make Space here in town, Every time I stop down there, I'm, I'm so impressed with, with the spirit of collaboration. It's just infectious and, and when you visit them. And I think, I think if you show that to people, you can't help but get them excited about the concept, too. So, you know, you might have to have a few plants here and there to sort of get that vibe going. But, but I think once it's really happening, I, I, most people just connect. And, and, and I don't know. That's the hope, anyway. <laughs> Well, and the, the tools, too. we're mm -hmm. talking about very different tools. I'm talking about um, sewing machines, and we do use actually computers at the Makery to draft patterns for jewelry design and um, sewing designs. But the, the machinery and the tools that you need are not, are not often things that people would have in their homes anyway. So the tools in their nature bring people together. For us, it's sewing machines and snap presses and um, uh, metal stamps and things like that. For these guys, it's a little different, but those the space is very important, and that's what we've said at the Makery. I think that's what you're saying is you bring the tools there and the people that have that interest come, and Luke Skywalker would not have been able to do all the cool stuff he did in that movie if he didn't have a cool space with all this stuff that was just so much fun to pull together. And so if you're talking about um, a dune buggy car like they're doing at the... Um, Discovery Space Camp, or if you're talking about some of the uh, stuff we do at the Makery, it's about having all that stuff in one place and all those tools that are pro cost prohibitive to have in your home, and then getting with a bunch of other people that have the same interest and like sparks fly. And I see that all the time at the Makery, particularly I'm working mostly with eight to 16 year old um, girls. And we just did a, a, a camp we call Fashion Camp there last week. But I stood at the end of camp and we did a presentation to the parents and I said, what is the best kept secret of this fashion camp is that these girls are engineering. They're using math to draft patterns and they have to think very linearly, lin linearly and they, um, they're, they're you know, designing clothing is not that different in a lot of ways than, than designing machinery or designing a, um, a robot or something like that. So it's about the stuff and the space and then people come together, I think. Yeah, Do you I mean, want to add anything here? Yeah, so I mean, it's a loaded question. You kind of hit a, hit a bunch of stuff. I mean, talking about globalization and, and teamwork and all this stuff, it's kind of like the million dollar question. Um, I guess if you at the crux of it, like, I guess time. So, I mean, people spend so much time, you know, on their phones, on their computers, learning all this technology that I don't think they're, you know, in business, I some of the soft skills I see less of anymore are, are the kind of like teamwork, communication, kind of like, you know, I hate to say it, but like the hard work, little things like that. Um, I think you're seeing um, people investing their time, this precious resource, into being on their computers. Um, maybe it's making, creating, what have you, rather than doing these team building activities, whether it's, you know, Little League or what have you, and, or really anything else. So I think that's, you know, part of it um, is, is, is that time hold time factor. Um, but I, I definitely see it in business as, as you have, you know, um, you have globalization, you know, with, with customs and what do you say, what don't you say. Um, 
so it's, I think it's a very loaded question, and um, you know, it's you really have to. I agree with you. You have to foster in um, an environment that that people can take an idea, you know, bounce it off other people, and, and maybe that's a, a web form or a physical space, like a library. So yeah. So the, the the solution to this is actually really simple. It, it's a simple recipe, but implementing it is the hard part. Right. And uh, you collapse disciplines and the disciplinary boundaries, and you collapse the age gender boundaries. And maker spaces are really great for doing that because you'll have kids teaching retirees how to do something. Mm -hmm. There's no bigger leveler than that, right? <laughs> John sees it, Justin has a catalyst space over uh, in um, Altoona that he's working in, and that these spaces are non denominational in a sense. They're non-discriminatory in terms of age or discipline. Really, this, the, the measure of your worth is what skills do you have to bring and what can you share and how much do you want to learn, right? Um, education is, is, I think, trying to play a little bit of a catch-up game because we have defined our entire educational uh, sort of structure in this sort of specialization track or by ages or things like that. And we see lots of change happening there. And, and, and you know, Troy in particular, I, I've taught some of Troy's students, and they are phenomenal. Um, so whatever he's doing, listen to what he's saying, because it's working. I know that for sure. Um, but when you get into the higher reaches, we have buildings that are dedicated to entire professions that are closed to people who are outside of that profession. It's, in my opinion, it's less productive than it could be, because you mentioned something. Uh, you said STEM and STEAM. Who in the room knows what STEM means? Okay, who knows what STEAM means? Not as many, right? So, so STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. STEAM is those same four, plus A for arts. And it's very interesting because what we're looking at right now, I've done a lot of work with the National Science Foundation, and they're talking about what's missing right now. Well. They're interested in transformative innovation. That's their big deal. That's why they have millions of dollars. And what's been missing, they've gotten a lot of good results, but they're not getting as great results as they want. And for them, creativity is the piece that is lagging behind. And the arts, this is what they have to offer, is creativity is a muscle you need to exercise much like you need to exercise all the other science, technology, engineering, and math skills. And our society hasn't traditionally valued this as much um, financially. Maybe culturally, we do in other ways. But educationally, they, they tend to lag behind. So that's my answer, is increased arts participation in all of these teams. It's not just about designing something and throwing it over the wall, but develop, co-developing, right? Um, and digital tools, why they make so much sense, and this is why I got suckered into it myself, is that I do a lot of collaboration in my own work. And why? Well, guess what? Everybody's using the same tools. Everybody's using the same equipment. That breaks down disciplinary jargon. I can now talk to somebody about how to make something with this piece of software that I use for X, but they're using for Y, and together we get to make Z, because we speak a common language. That's why it's so interesting. And the same is true for any analog skill that people have, any traditional skill. If you know a little bit about how to do metal work, and you might do you know, P over here, and somebody else is doing Q, but you can make S together. right? So broadening the scope, broad, broadening the filter. right? Um, who has some other questions and thoughts and comments? Yes? I'm very fond of Project Runway on the Lifetime Network. And I think, I think that with Lifetime Network, uh, the people who participate in that have an, uh, have an actual um, ability to use a, a, a highly uh, trained technology that's available to them to create a clothing, which is, is quite remarkable. And it, it is a sort of steam process because they have a very limited amount of time, uh, both with project management in terms of first their own uh, uh, their own team, uh, individual team or per, uh, uh, clothing, and then with a group of other people and in, in managing 
um, a, this project in a very limited amount of time. So I think that one for, for any, anyone who is interested in, in uh, uh, management of time and resources is a very is a very fascinating process to work every week. I also like Survivor, so uh, <laughs> I think I think that this is a, a different end of the scale than Survivor, and some of the same things are happening in that uh, very very isolated environment on an island. So, yeah, uh, having been a part of uh, Human Resources. Um, office for uh, 20 years, I have learned to, to uh, after uh, actually majoring in art history, to get this sense of management that I would never have had if I had just been around an art museum or something all the time. I think that's an excellent point. It was something I was going to say about it too, is a lot of my closest friends are, for whatever reason, artists, and they are they are the people I know that will put in the most insane amount of hours into something of anyone I know. I mean, I'm not saying, I'm sure there are engineers and other you know, inventors, entrepreneurs that do that as well. But I think that's something I learn from artists a lot is, is there's, there are no bounds to, to the amount of time I will put into this project. And I think you know, there, that's sort of a boundary stretching exercise in and of itself is just to be around that, that sort of approach to, to creating. <laughs> you mentioned fashion. I have to tell you, one of the hottest areas for digital application mm -hmm. is fashion design. I mean, you are working with compound curvature that moves. This is really a complicated problem to solve. You know, if you're talking about very rigid materials, we don't wear armor anymore, <laughs> right? Or, I mean, under armor doesn't count, right? But. Uh, <laughs> It's an incredibly hot area. The Dutch are crazy for digital fashion, if you follow. I mean, check it out. It's, it's unbelievable what's going on. So this is an area where engineers and computer scientists are collaborating with fashion designers and creating amazing things, right? I want to hear, I don't know if any of you younger people have uh, thoughts like, why are you here? Are you interested in this whole digital stuff? Because I know that you know a friend of my, my wife's four years old said when mom and dad said we need to buy a new car the four-year-old said no 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 we're not buying a new car we're gonna buy a 3d printer and print one <laughs> i mean you know it's like wow when you're four and you're growing up with these things you know it's it staples you know you tend to think in a very very different way what are you guys thinking are you excited about the future with this stuff or not or is this like oh yeah okay Look at this, all, all eyes. Come on, come on, volunteer. Let's hear from you. Come on, say something about this. Do you, are you interested in this? Have you 3D printed anything? No, I haven't 3D printed anything, but I want to experience that more. You do. All right, so wait, you know about, like, tomorrow we're doing a big 3D printing deal with cookie cutters up here in the muscle room. Thursday we're doing the scanning of heads. Definitely you should do it. How about you guys? Have you 3D printed? I forget. <laughs> <laughs> did you design it or did you just 3D print something? No, no. It was for tech ed, so yeah, I designed it. Oh, okay, cool. So you were using the software and actually printing something. And it was a very memorable experience because you. <laughs> you <laughs> that. Right, how about you? And um, I learned how to design my own things and uh, print them out. Wait, it was cool? Yeah? Awesome. Would you do more? What? Would you do more? Yeah, All right. Okay, anybody else? Because we're officially closing in to where we're supposed to be scheduled. We can all sit here and chit chat, that's mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, please do. Uh, yeah, give the order people a chance here. Um, I was actually thinking that the A was architecture, and that would have been my guess. Um, Architects would prefer to think right. that, but no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an architect, I have to say it. I've already heard the expression, uh, third industrial revolution, you know, the next big thing after smartphones. Um, but, you know, and, and, and I've seen, you know, the car, the four-year-old car, I've seen this one-piece car, I've seen the buildings are going to be manufactured, I've seen these rocket, you know, propelling you know, the thrusters being made that you can't even machine out of them, you've got to get little metal things. But whenever I see 
you know, the kind of things that are offered to us. I see these little uh, plastic wire things, you know, I've, I've seen so many little Yodas everywhere, blue Yodas, green Yodas, <laughs> red Yodas. I mean, I, I run a business and, uh, you know, right now I'm, 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 you know, I kind of prototype stuff, but I use extrude, you know, I contact companies and get extruded parts and machine and, and stuff like that. I'd love to be able to get um, something that, that would just produce something which initially, uh, like you said, in the iterative stage, uh, um, go through several stages and then, then use that as, as a production product. Um, so my, my question basically, really, I, I guess, uh, sorry, UPS guy, um, <laughs> is, is uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you, you just tell me what machine you have and I'll, I'll go, I'll go uh, and, and Google it and, uh, you know, figure out just what it, what it is that it can do. But my question is, when is that going to come down to us, you know, the, 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 the guys there, um, not, not involved in learning, but just, you know, stuff we actually want to I guess we can be doers as, as well as makers and, and not see this thing far, far away and, and, and you know, like I'm sure that, that, that Metal Lab and Penn State is, if you're a Penn Stater, if you have a security clearance for ARL, you know, and, 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 and all, all the various groups you got. dollar donation. Uh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> tough, that. tough, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, when's it, I, I really, the reason I'm here is because I really want this to, to reach me. And I, you know, and that's, I'm in sponge mode right now, so I'm absorbing, so... Um, 2022, that's my prediction. No. <laughs> I mean, 3D printing has been around, like, like, it's just become hot, but it's been around since, what, the 70s, late 60s, um, as rapid prototyping. So, you know, General Motors or whatever needed something quick. Instead of, you talked about extruding, that's traditional manufacturing, where you take something out of, you know, a block of, a hunk of steel or something. Um, you know, it's just in the past 10 years or so that's kind of ballooned, um, really more so in the past five years. Um, so the technology will, be, will get better, um, but I mean the machine we have is, is tens of thousands of dollars. Um, it's reliable, it has all this proprietary support material which can do the moving parts. So there's kind of really a huge difference between that and an at-home printer, which can, can take your idea to concept. Uh, it might not do the moving parts, might not have a a heated chamber, um, and so on and so forth, um, or have the build envelope. So you're, you're, you're looking, kind of comparing different things. So if you're looking for you know, precision, reliability, you might want you know, um, a higher end machine. It just you know, it might take five years to get there, or 10 years. Okay. Right. So, right. Sorry. Does that answer your question? I, it does, okay. yeah. Um, just so you know, there's, a, there's an Australian based company right now that is going to produce a $5,000 metal-based printer. So when we're talking about the technology changing quickly, mm -hmm. that's quick. Okay. You're going from a, million, a half a million to a million dollar printer to a five thousand dollar printer in a matter of a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, that's going to come out this yeah. year. And, and I'm not thinking about owning the print, I'm thinking about a service like, like, like you offer there. Mm -hmm. um, so I can, you know, yeah. pay my uh, 50 bucks. Uh, I, I buy uh, from this company in the Midwest that sells the kind of standard DIN extrusion aluminum thing, very crude, but that cost me 60 bucks, you know, so if I can make something with all the various fittings, where all the, the cameras and lenses and filters that I, that I, that I look at from the current thing I'm, I'm working on, that'd be great, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what we do. We, we help uh, people that work, um, at-home tinkers, inventors, even um, um, engineering firms in town, so. Yeah, we, we are in the salad days. I mean, it's remarkable that there are consumer-grade devices albeit inadequate, but in many ways in terms of material properties. But one of the things that's really holding us back is material science and patents and trademarks. Those are the biggest things that are limiting what's happening now. It's not the creative juices, it's not the ability to produce, but there is a lot of technology that's out there that's developed and can be brought downstream, but people own it. And you know it is a matter of time in that regard. But I will say, five years ago, Never dreamed you'd be able to buy a printer for, you know, five hundred to fifteen hundred dollars and and just mess around with it. I mean, it's it's pretty incredible. So we are in a, an era where we expect magic. Like a lot of people think this is a push the button and it works. No, there's all kinds of problems. They they you know I'm upstairs all day playing with five different printers that are brand new out of the box and we've had misprints. We've had things that misfeed. I mean, it's just we're just not there yet, right? But we're participating in it, which kind of 
sparks your creativity a little bit to try and figure out, well, how do you make it better? And people are. It's pretty remarkable. But there are services doing what you say, and, and they're out there. They might not be affordable for production, but they're pretty affordable for prototyping. So um, looking at our clock here, uh, I just want to remind, and we can, anybody can stay and we can chat informally and all that, but I know some people will have plans for the evening. Um, I want to highlight the Makespace is doing a uh, workshop. Uh, they will be all week. At starting at 6.30 or 7.30 and going on until you can't stand up anymore because those people stay up all night because they're, you know, all they live on is Coca-Cola and uh, Monster Energy drink. But uh, as long as you're there, they will talk to you and help you. But uh, tonight, soldering and Ethernet wiring and check your calendar. There's a bunch of really cool events, singing Tesla coils. We'll talk about 3D printing and all of that. Um, Discovery Space is doing amazing camps right now throughout the week. And uh, there will be races, as Michelle was saying, on Saturday. Uh, Justin's doing a robotics workshop on Thursday. More presentation down uh, Friday and Saturday. Friday and Saturday. Here in this room. Yeah. Yeah. And Saturday, there's going to be a really big event, you know, out in the park. So uh, come and check it out. Tell your friends. Um, anybody want to add anything before we release the masses? Have I missed anything important? The one other thing about the Saturday event I'm trying to get the word out on because I'm excited about it personally is community show and tell. So if you've made anything at all that you would like to take 10 minutes and share with whoever's in the community, um, we're going to open up sign up for that on Saturday morning here at the library at 9 a.m. But, uh, but yeah, you can, you can reserve a 10 minute slot and, and I'm hoping to take some video of that too. We can do a little mashup video or something, but it would be great to see what, what the community's made. Yeah, fantastic. Yes, John. We'll walk you down to the main space. If anyone wants to go down, you don't have to participate in the uh, uh, workshop. You can just take a tour. And, uh... Yeah, it's worth checking out. It's uh, right now. It's it's our first step forward into getting something very, very, very robust to serve as many people. It's our little toe in the water, and there's some really cool things happening over there, and the people are fantastic. They will help you with anything you want to do, and. Kudos to John, he's been involved for, when did you start, what year, John? 2011, so for the past four years plus, uh, John's been steadfastly building this community and get involved if you're interested, it's, it's a great group. <laughs> yeah, uh, let me tell you where it is, 141 South Fraser. It's, if you go on the parking garage, for those of you who know that little alleyway that cuts through, it's down there, down below.